Um, uh, today I'm going to cover a few aspects of the last uh, two questions I've asked you, actually last three questions I've asked you in the assignment. Uh, um, maybe I've numbered them, yeah. Um, primarily to do with uh, looking at single particle transport in uh, uh, all kinds of quantum situations, uh, 1D, you know, quantum wires, two-dimensional electron gases, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, so on. Uh, uh, so um, uh, just to kind of uh, remind ourselves, uh, the treatment uh, with these operators we developed earlier was really meant for many particle physics, uh, which we'll cover later. Uh, at this point, we are looking at a, a single particle transport. Uh, and um, as I had uh, requested, uh, please start uh, also uh, you know, reading uh, these two handouts, uh, which also have the assignment problems, which you, you will see that a lot of the stuff I talk about, uh, uh, should, uh, you should find uh, quite a bit of that information in, in those two handouts. OK, so, yeah. okay, so uh, uh, I'll. Uh, uh, the way I want to uh, discuss the material today is uh, 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 get started. So essentially, we'll start looking at examples now uh, and, and look at particular cases and uh, apply uh, what we have learned uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know, the quantum foundation of transport. Uh, we, 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 uh, uh, here's, here's a very short summary of... Uh, uh, you know, the, of, of the concepts that you can apply to any transport problem. Um, now, uh, in quantum mechanics, we have realized that uh, particles, uh, specifically electrons for our case uh, now for single particle physics, uh, whether they are free, whether they're in a solid, uh, uh, you know, uh, in any situation you put them in, uh, they will have uh, a range of uh, energies and momenta, right? So you'll get a uh, Ks and corresponding energies. It may be a band, it may be a free electron, uh, whatever be it, right? So you'll get some sort of an energy dispersion, and that dispersion we write as E of K, <coughs> right? Uh, and uh, for free electron, uh, it's just a simple parabola. For electrons in a solid, uh, you may have uh, a brilliant zone like that, and you may have these discrete. Uh, states for the electron, right? And uh, um, you may have, uh, depending upon the number of orbitals in each side of, of the lattice, you may have one band, you may have two bands, you may have eight bands, whatever be it, right? So essentially, for each k, I can have either a single energy state or I can have multiple energy states like that, right? So uh, now, uh, this is kind of the end result of what you know, in many solid state physics and quantum courses, you would say it's a band structure of a electron in any situation you put in. For a free electron, it's parabola. For all kinds of other solids, for graphene, uh, for example, uh, instead of uh, having a gap, uh, you may have a cone uh, where the, the gap is zero, where they intersect, you know, the two EKs intersect and so on. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, whatever situation you put the electrons in, uh, they, uh, there will be a corresponding electronic band structure for that situation. And now, uh, a transport problem is uh, you're not going to move the electrons uh, around in that uh, solid, uh, in, be it graphene or, or vacuum or whatever be it. You're going to move the electrons. And the way we're going to move the electrons is by uh, uh, connecting uh, uh, electrodes to this population of electrons in the, let's say, solid. And uh, uh, we can initially just discuss with two, two electrodes and later on add the third terminal. We can add multiple terminals uh, in, a, in a, a Hall effect measurement, maybe six terminals and so on. Right? But with two terminals, uh, typically we'll call one as the source and the other as the drain of electrons. And I think the name is meant really uh, uh, to, to signify that, uh, uh, well, this is going to supply electrons, it's a source of electrons, and this is going to drain out the electrons, you know, remove the electrons from whatever is the, uh, uh, you know, solid or uh, material that you put inside here, okay? And in, inside here is all this stuff ha is happening inside here, the band structure and all that stuff. Uh, so, so it could be a nanotube or graphene or whatever you connect. And there are two electrodes. These electrodes are uh, uh, have two energy levels. One has uh, 
uh, Fermi level EF source is the energy of the highest field in orbitals of the, it could be a metal, typically it's a metal. Uh, and uh, here, uh, this is uh, drain, which is also metal, and you call it EF of drain. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 they could be at different potentials. For example, if this, these are two metals, uh, then the potential difference between them is Q times the voltage you apply across, you know, with the battery. That's the physical meaning. If I take two metals, if I just have vacuum in between them, that's a parallel plate capacitor, right? And uh, 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 if I apply uh, voltage V, then uh, I think you know that uh, uh, there'll be a charge, which is capacitance times voltage that will be moved around, right? So two metal plates are always charge neutral, but if I apply a voltage across vacuum, if this is vacuum, you know, your capacitance if it's a parallel plate capacitor, for example, epsilon A by D is kind of the you know, capacitance of this region. And that times the voltage will signify how many electrons were you know, taken away from this metal, and, uh, or rather taken away uh, from this metal and put here. You know, that's the physical meaning of, of a capacitance and battery and all that. But now we are actually trying to, if it's a vacuum, we're saying that we are not able to inject carriers. But if it's a semiconductor, we will be able to inject carriers. Okay? But uh, hopefully the meaning of a voltage is very clear. The, the battery, or the, when we apply a voltage, all that the battery really is doing is moving electrons from one electrode to another, you know, and, and, right? And if it's a vacuum or it's a very highly, if there's a very high impedance for the electrons to move through this region, then the electron transport will occur from outside, not from inside. Does that make sense? Through the connection here, which is your battery, you know, or uh, you know, something like that. That, 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 that will always appear. Uh, so, so there's, uh, uh, now uh, we are obviously interested in uh, electron transport through this region. Uh, and in this region, we fit in our uh, electronic system for which we have, at this point, uh, we are assuming we have solved the band structure problem either by tight binding, DFT, whatever, you know, suits, uh, uh, whatever, whichever method suits us. We have done that and we have put in a solid here with the uh, uh, atoms and all that stuff, and, and here's the electronic band structure, right? So now, uh, with this uh, uh, situation, uh, uh, you can see that, uh, let's say, let's say, uh, you know, here's my gap, and the electronic band structure inside this entire region is such that the conduction band minima is kind of here, and valence band minimum, uh, sorry, maximum is like here, you know, let's say, right? Then, uh, the question one might ask is, will there be transport in this situation, right? Will there be any transport, right? And you can see now these states are filled, right? And these states are empty. So uh, uh, these states are empty, right? And if I do this measurement at very, very low temperatures, then uh, uh, you can see that uh, transport uh, you know, thermodynamically at least, uh, this metal uh, has a lot of electrons. It wants to get rid of it. If it could get rid of it by putting, you know, transporting it through this channel into this region, it will. It can lower its energy, right? The, the, the system can lower its energy. But it doesn't find any allowed energies inside here, right? Because you're, it's facing the gap of the material. Does that make sense? It's facing the gap of the material. So no matter how many electrons you have in your bands inside here, you know, you may have 10 to the power 23 per centimeter cube electrons, uh, all that. You know, if you have a filled ba valence band and a conduction band which is out of range of reach of the Fermi levels of the two metals, there'll be, you know, the transport will be extremely weak. Basically, it'll be an extremely resistive situation. Right? So, it, so this would be an insulating situation. If I start heating up this structure, then uh, you know that uh, uh, you know, I, I will have a Fermi Dirac. Uh, at zero Kelvin, my Fermi Dirac distribution looks like this. You know? It's zero here, occupation function, and it reaches one inside, you know, below the Fermi level, right? But as I start heating up, then I will st start spreading out. You know, uh, I'll start essentially you know, boiling a, a little bit of the, you know, or evaporating, if you might, some electrons out to higher energies. And those electrons can now get in there. Right? Does that make sense? So, so they could. Uh, reach 
so, so that would be uh, a heat or thermionically uh, activated sort of transport. Okay? But uh, what I want to say is let's, uh, for argument's sake, just look at the situation where it's at low temperature. And you can see right away that there, you know, it really does not matter how much electrons you have uh, in the solid. Uh, in fact, all solids, you know, be it copper or a piece of wood, have this many electrons per centimeter cube, right? I mean, or, or water, whatever have you, right? And it's just that some of them uh, uh, will conduct and some of them won't. And uh, so here's, you know, that, that would be one of the So here, uh, uh, on the other hand, if I had a situation where the conduction band was, you know, something like that, right? Conduction band was something like that. Uh, uh, well, you can see, hopefully, that, uh, uh, you know, the, the metal now on the left is able to inject carriers uh, into into these states, right? into into the conduction band empty states, and uh, here's here's a kind of a physical situation when an electron is injected from the metal into this semiconductor or, or you know into this band, then the electrons that have come from the metal are moving to the right, right? in this picture they're moving to the right, and therefore. If there is no scattering allowed at all, if the electron you know, comes in ballistically from the metal with a certain momentum or, and a certain energy, it can only populate the right going branch. Right? Only the right going branch, not the left going branch. These branch electrons are going to the left. Right? So the electron must fit. Uh, both energy and momentum uh, must be conserved. So, so essentially, if the electron momentum comes, so it, will, it will have to enter. Uh, it injects the source injects carriers into into the right going state or the right half branch of the band structure, not the left going. Yeah. On the other hand, the drain is able to inject carriers if it's you know at a finite temperature or if you are even lower here, it's able to inject to the left, right? So these states, under ballistic situations when there's no scattering, are in equilibrium with the drain. They are, you know, they, they exchange particles, and you know, and, and whereas these states are in equilibrium with the source, and uh, and this really is going to be a recurring theme in this course. From here, you can just with this simple concept that right-going states are filled by the source, and left-going states are filled by the drain, and they are in equilibrium with each other, meaning that they share the same Fermi levels. Same Fermi levels. That's the, the quantitative way of saying equilibrium. With that, you can really derive and, and explain quite a bit of physical phenomena, like quantized conductance and all kinds of you know things like that. And so, on. yeah, question. Um, so, with the energy of that, uh, it, did you say it was a photon or an electron? No, no, no. Everything is electrons at this okay, point. So right. the, the the kinetic energy of that electron would it correspond to the would it correspond to whatever that uh, crystal momentum? Yes. Like yes, yes, indeed, indeed. So uh, I'm going to discuss the aspect of crystal momentum and real momentum here. But uh, essentially, uh, what we are saying at this point is, uh, it, you know, the energy is conserved. It's not emitting phonons. It's not dropping in, in energy. Now, how the momentum, the total momentum, how it is conserved, that will have to, you know, you have to involve the crystal momentum. Because inside a solid, this K, is not kind of the free electron momentum, but it has the free electron k and k plus minus some crystal momenta and so on, right? So uh, w the way this, uh, this sort of transport would occur is energy is conserved and the momentum is uh, such, it's conserved in the sense that the, the net k here is the net k it started with, you know, from the metal. You know? So, so that's, in, uh, that's the sense in which it is conserved, yeah. But, uh, okay, so, uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll look into that right now, uh, but uh, what I'll do is first, instead of jumping into the ballistic part, we'll also allow scattering, and we can derive Ohm's law too from here directly, which is the classical transport equation. Ohm's law is V is equal to IR, right? We have a resistance, all that. So that we'll derive, um, and, uh, uh, and then look at the quantum version of it, complete quantum version of it. Okay. So uh, this sort of picture, so essentially you can see that the conductance here, you know, uh, let me check if I have another pen. Uh, yeah. So if I were to be plotting the conductance uh, of, which is, you know, V over I, let's say, uh, 
uh, V over I is R, right? So I over V, right? Uh, current over voltage, voltage is this, and how much current is flowing. Then if this band was over here, we said it's very low conductance. And if I somehow manage to push this down for the same material, then I'll get a very high conductance, right? This is a very simple picture, right? And this is exactly the whole idea of a transistor, a field effect transistor. In a field effect transistor, you're moving this, this band is tied to a third terminal, which is the gate. You know? That's your gate, you're tuning it, it's your, you know, uh, 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 the knob in the faucet or whatever. You turn it, it goes up, and you're off, right? Turn it a little bit, apply 0.5 volts, you push it down, and it's on, and the change is eight or nine orders, you know? So, so it's uh, on to off. That's what you're doing in a, and then when I sketch it, the whole thing moves. It's not just the conduction band. The gap doesn't change. The whole thing moves. You know. Yeah. Is it? Uh, yeah, I was about to ask. Uh, when you apply a greater voltage, just does like do the Fermi levels move? Or do the, yeah. like, the, the channel move? Yeah. So uh, this, this I will discuss in great detail. So the whole thing moves. And the uh, so let's say here's you can see the Fermi level uh, of this region then will not just be controlled by the source and drain, but also by the gate now. So there, you know, there's another control to it. And the gap of a semiconductor will always remain the same. You know? So if I move this, this will move in, in you know, uh, tandem. Uh, but the Fermi level, as I move it up here, the Fermi level moves, and it moves uh, in a way that's dependent both on the gate and the drain, you know, and basically both these voltages. This we can assume to be grounded. And so you have to assume one of them is ground and then everything. And we're going to derive this in great detail. How does the Fermi level move and all that? Okay, so, but the Fermi level moves. In fact, the reason the current really goes to zero is, is, is because your occupation function, you know, your CK dagger CK, if you might, that is what is changing. And you are, with a gate, you are able to, you know, uh, remove the carriers here. You know. So you can think of it as a capacitor. You're controlling the number of electrons here with a gate capacitance, C gate. And uh, gate voltage times the gate capacitance is the number of electrons that is occupied here. You know, capacitance and voltage is the charge. And then uh, if you go below a certain threshold, there's no charge left here. And that's when the, this thing has moved out of the window. And, uh, and the other important concept here, which is, uh, I think, goes probably without saying, but I think I would like to still emphasize it, is uh, this situation is, is very simple now if you think of it as, uh, as, as uh, you know, let's, let's just look at, instead of a whole semiconductor, if I had just one atom, for example, or a defect, it could be silicon dioxide, which is a very large insulator. The conduction band is over there. Valence band is over here. But let's say there's just one defect here. You know, an atomic state may be an uh, oxygen vacancy in silicon dioxide, which has created an, an energy state that's allowed here. Then you can see that uh, this energy state, which is, say, neutral to start with, sees to the left, and it sees so many electrons at higher energies than it, right? And these electrons will try to fill this state, right, to lower their own energy, right? Whereas uh, it sees to the right, and it sees, you know, quite a few states that are empty, right? And, uh, and, and then, as a result, you know, these, the, uh, the electron would like to go there you know, rather than stay here. Does that make sense? I mean, just to lower its energy again, right? And this is the step which really is the indicative of transport that uh, because of uh, the so-called difference in you know, the agendas of these two electrodes, one of them always wants to fill states below its Fermi level. The other always wants to empty it, right? And as a result, if the state is somewhere here in the middle, it can never uh, reach. Uh, uh, so essentially, this will continually try to fill it, and this will continually try to empty it. And, there's, and that is the meaning of current flow. The electrons are shuttling from here to there, right? So this is the current flow, reason for current flow. And, uh, and when we look at a band structure, you know, basically we are looking at many such states. That's all. We just sum over all of them it's in a solid, right? You can, uh, uh, show it from a single state, but uh, you can sum over. Now you can see if, 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 if your state is here on the other hand, uh, it basically both of them try to empty it, and it will empty out, and then nothing will happen. There's no more current flow, right? So that's why it's resistive. And if the state is here, then both of them will fill it, 
and that's game over. There's nothing else that's going to happen, right? So it's occupied and no current, unoccupied and no current. This is when the occupation function is between zero and one and there's current flow. Right? So, so this is the fundamental way or reason why transport occurs. And you can see this is a drive for both electrodes to bring your system to equilibrium with, its, with themselves, right? And this tug, you know, push and pull uh, is what results in current flow. This, this imbalance leads to the current flow, right? And if the states are outside this window, then there is not much current flow. So all the action happens within a window of Q times the voltage you apply. Right? So all the action of current flow. Yeah, there was a question. Yeah. So the, the bottom one is the heat uh, Yeah, so I'm at this point not quite saying how these states came about, but yeah. I mean, for example, if you have a wide, very wide band gap insulator and there's a deep trap inside, yeah, so this could so be that. Uh, yeah, deep trap typically means that uh, if I have a semiconductor with a band gap and a tr there's an extra defect or something like that, a missing atom or another, whose energy is very deep, both from conduction band and from valence band. It's almost near the middle of the gap. That is the meaning of a deep trap. Here, uh, you know, it depends where are the band edges, you know, so, so I don't want to, yeah. Okay, so. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, in uh, uh, I think the next assignment, one of the problems you'll do is for the single electro, a single state, you can calculate what is the current flow, and you'll see that it is related to the quantum of conductance, which we'll derive today as well. We'll derive it for the band, but you can also do it for the single state. So, now these things are not really thought experiments. Uh, uh, people are able to put down like a you know organic molecule, uh, a chain of you know molecule uh, states such, and they are able to do measurements like these or a DNA strand or things like that and you can measure this stuff you know, today and, and this is possible to measure and people really, that's where all this stuff came from in the first place. And most of these concepts became clear in uh, 1990s and 2000s and all that sort of, it's, it's, it's relatively new in that sense. Okay, okay so now, now let's get down to uh, really uh, solving the a problem and we'll see how this on off and all this stuff happens but this is really conceptually the key uh, you know takeaway for uh, what is the driving force for transport so so this this is really it any questions here uh, yeah and joe yeah yeah so uh, well from here, you can see that there, if there is no voltage difference, there's no current, right? Meaning there is none of this driving force I mentioned, right? There's no out of equilibrium. And uh, d was your question that, is that your question? Or? So if the energy mismatch is greater than the applied voltage, also no Oh, energy mismatch between? Uh, yeah. Oh, I see. Very good question. So uh, you can see also, uh, I have not really uh, derived that, but if my energy level was somewhere here compared to somewhere exactly in the middle, the currents would be different. And that really depends on how strongly it couples to both sides, gamma left. We're going to look into that, you know, gamma right, the coupling strengths of the two. From there, you can evaluate how does it depend. Uh, if you were to plot the currents, uh, you can imagine it will kind of, you know, have some sort of a shape like that, depending upon where is it. Is, if it's here, it will be this much current. If it's here, if it's here, and so on. It will max out somewhere in the middle, depending upon how strongly it's coupled to the both sides. You know, so. okay. But we'll look into that. Uh, you will actually be able to solve this and show exactly what is the current, depending upon where is it in, in between the states. Uh, okay. so. Um, so let's start uh, by uh, laying down a few of the, uh, you know, um, general uh, expressions that we are going to use repeatedly. Uh, this is almost a repeat, but I'll still write it one, uh, once again. There are three quantities of high interest in transport. Uh, uh, the first, I will call it as what is the total number of electrons and number of states available for transport, right? Total number of electron uh, states available for transport. Let's look at this picture now, not so much this one. And uh, because this is a very general picture, uh, and, and uh, uh, so the total number of electrons, how do you find that? Uh, you know, uh, we have to use uh, both back and forth, really. So let's say it is this band, the conduction band, that is in between these electrodes, you know. So let's say, okay. 
if it's a valence band, you choose the valence band. You know, it depends on which band you're talking about. Okay, so the valence band would be a p-channel or p-type whole whole transport. Conduction band would be electron transport or so on. But uh, the number of states, uh, I think, you can see uh, in, in, in a very simple way that it is the number of states would be the sum over uh, um, if I have you know uh, a certain number of states here. Uh, then the total number of electrons in that band will be very simply just that, right? If it's occupied, if I want to count how many electrons there are, not how many states, I know exactly how many states there are, right? That's 2n, I know, uh, 2n, which is the number of atoms in the crystal, right? I'm saying how many of them are occupied with electrons, right? So uh, f of k is the occupation function of that state, right? Occupation function, and uh, now, at this point of time, when I connect electrodes to it, the occupation function need not be the Fermi Dirac distribution. It's a non-equilibrium situation. Okay. Only when uh, some, something is in equilibrium, you have a Fermi Dirac distribution. If you are out of equilibrium, it can change. And that change is the driver for transport. But whatever be it, the occupation function, and I sum it over all k's of that band, you know, I sum it over all k's of that band, I get the total number of electrons. Is that, is that you know, simple enough, right? But then uh, we have also talked about each state can fill, uh, each state can hold two spins, right? So we add in that spin degeneracy, G sub S. And the second thing I mentioned was in K space, you may have multiple, multiple such minima, not necessarily just one, maybe two or six, or silicon it would be six. That's called a valley degeneracy. These are integers. and. Uh, you know, uh, I'm just trying to generalize it further, right? So that's that's your uh, total number of uh, electrons in that band. Spin degeneracy times valid degeneracy. That's how many, you know, states are there uh, at that particular uh, at that particular k at different spins and different values, and then you sum over the occupation function and done, right? That's the total number. And uh, uh, the total number, uh, instead of typically summing it, what we will be doing is we'll be integrating it by uh, you know, saying that this is a, a solid which has uh, you know, a macroscopic length big L. And so the separation between k's is 2 pi over L, right? This minus that. So the separations are 2 pi over L. And then this integral becomes dk over 2 pi over L. Uh, f of k. That's for one dimension, just one dimension. If you have small, let's say, if you have d dimensions, which is two dimensions, or three, or one, right? Then uh, I think I, I'll write it in general as d to the power d, right? And this will become to the power d because in one dimension it's a length, in two dimensions it's an area, right? And uh, in three dimensions, it's a you know volume or cube, so it should it should go like that: two pi over l whole cubed, or squared, or one, right? Two, three, one. Right? Does that make sense? I mean, this is the general form, and and uh, uh, so that's the total number of particles, and but we are typically not interested in the total number of particle electrons. So what I'm going to do is just do a little change here: g s g v, and I'm going to pull this two pi factor out and write it as ddk times the occupation function. And I'm going to take this L to the power d you know, to the left side. Just you know, take it to the left side. And what is physically the meaning of L, which is the length dimension, uh, the length scale, to the power d? You know, that's the, uh, is it the real one or is it the real? This is real space, right? Yeah, two pi, you're right. Two pi by this to the power d is the volume of one unit of the, you know, uh, uh, Brillouin zone, not the whole Brillouin zone. The whole Brillouin zone is 2 pi over a, small a, lattice constant. This is the macroscopic length, right? But if I take it here, uh, this is effectively the total number of particles over the total volume. Now volume, uh, I hope you understand, in 3D it's, it's per centimeter, it's centimeter cube, in 2D it's area, in 1D it's just a length, right? This is, it's a, right? And so now what you have is a particle density, and this we are going to denote with small n. You know, particle density 
which has uh, naturally units of one over meter or in semiconductors and electronics we typically use centimeters you know mixed units uh, so 1d would be 1 over centimeter 2d would be 1 over centimeter square and 3d is 1 over centimeter cube right? yeah, that's fine yeah so that's the total number of electrons and it's a sum over all, all cases this is just a formal way of writing it uh, again, uh, just bear with me if you have seen this before. It's, uh, we're we're going to start using it, so I think it's better I just write it down. You know, so. And uh, uh, okay, now uh, uh, exactly in the same way, if I were to ask the question, what is the total? Uh, you know, this is the particle uh, density per unit volume. Uh, let me uh, ask another question. What is the total energy in that, you know, electronic system in that band? You know, how do I find that total energy in this band? Uh, yeah. Exactly. It's, it's exactly the same thing, except sitting here would be the energy of the K state. Uh, now, uh, you know, that would be the total energy, right? So let me write it down. Does, does that make sense? If, uh, total energy is just the uh, same deal, uh, except I'm just, instead of just adding the occupation number, I'm adding occupation number times the energy of that state, right? That's very simple, right? GV uh, dk uh, over 2 pi to the power d. Uh, now, again, I'll have a L to the power d in the denominator times f of k times e of k, right? That's the energy right, of this system. And you can evaluate it, uh, uh, again, just in analogy to the particle density, you can also define an energy density as, you know, kind of the average energy, I don't know, write it in some way, average energy per particle. It's not the energy of every particle, but it's, if you multiply that times big N, you will get the total energy again. Right? Right. So, Right, right. So, so this is energy per per particle. Uh, so, all of them you can see will be some uh, some sort of an integral in k space, or you can convert it into energy space. You, know, you can go back and forth really. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and the third uh, quantity. Uh, okay, so that's the energy for. You know, see? And uh, I I also hope you can see that it will be somewhere you know between here and here, right? somewhere between here and here if your particles are, if the Fermi level is, it really depends on where is the Fermi level. The Fermi level is somewhere in the gap, then the total energy would be somewhere between the conduction band minima and the conduction band maxima, somewhere there. It's an average value, right? And it depends on few things like density of states and all that sort of thing. And finally, the uh, current, uh, the total current, uh, we are, just like we found particle density energy density, instead of current, we are going to say energy, current density. You know. Current density in the same vein. Uh, uh, this, this is, this is uh, uh, you know, again, I'll, I'm writing it for a charge current. Charge of each such particle is Q if it's an electron. Times, again, we do spin and value degeneracy. Uh, uh, now, the current density, if you go back and look, uh, the expression for it looks something like this. So I'm just going to write it down. Uh, Vg of k current density is it, it's a vector uh, times f of k. So this is your expression for the current density. It comes from this quantum expression of the wave function and all that sort of thing. So I'm just kind of writing it down without going back again and deriving it. So, and this is the group velocity. You know this term. Just like you can see, uh, instead of energy now, you have a velocity term sitting there. And uh, uh, so in general, then I would write it as Q. Uh, in fact, I'm going to generalize it even further. Uh, this is the current density uh, you know, for, for uh, states that, that are uh, you know, with these occupation functions and all that. But you will, in, uh, in your current assignment, you are solving problems which have you know, like barriers that may look something like that. No. So and then you have electrons incident from this side, right? And for each energy or each k, there is a certain transmission probability, you know, that that comes out from that side. You know, there's a certain transmission probability. And for example, in this situation, the transmission probability 
you know, if this is your barrier for electrons, and you know, I'm, I'm plotting it as a function of, say, energy. Okay. Energy, energy. Uh, for this situation, electrons at this energy have very small barrier to go through, so it will be close to one. It won't be exactly one. There will be some, you know, f oscillations because of all these things. But it will be very close to one. And then when you go down here, it starts tunneling. We're going to look into that a little bit today. And you know, there'll be some features, and it'll go to kind of close to zero here. Right? So that's, that's what's called the transmission probability for going from one electrode to another. So for example, I can create situations where the you know, uh, energy, uh, energy potential, uh, the potential energy is going to look something like this. Or it may have a barrier here, or it may have a well here. I can create all these situations in, in semiconductor solid. Whatever be it, there is a certain transmission probability, T of K or T of E, associated with it for go from one electrode to another you know, uh, based on the electron wave function. So I should multiply it really by the T of K to generalize it even further. Right? Uh, this is, if, if T of K is one, that's more like a free electron sort of picture. There's no barrier for it. You know? There's transmission is one. You know? So, uh, and, and from here, uh, we get a GS, GV, and over L to the power D. And then again, you can convert this into an integral uh, and uh, over 2 pi to the power D over L to the power D. Okay. All right, so this is really the expression uh, we are going to run with and be able to explain quite a bit of the transport, uh, you know, quantum transport phenomena from here. By the way, so the L to the power D will cancel out here. You know, and it just becomes simpler. Uh, uh, current density. It becomes this this expression. So. Okay, so uh, let's start applying it to a few situations now, and then see. So here's here are the three situations. Just as a order of magnitude, you know, if I'm looking at a a, a metal, for example, uh, the electron density per unit volume, you know, electron number per unit volume, how many per centimeter cube will I have for a, for a band in a metal? So each atom in a metal provides typically one electron, or give or take, you know, uh, one electron for conduction. So if I do this for a metal, I'll get about 10 to the power 22 or 23 per centimeter cube for a metal. Uh, for a 2D metal, so that's three-dimensional. For a two-dimensional metal, like niobium selenide or something like that, what's a good you know, rule of thumb? You can, if again you have a, uh, each atom providing an electron, uh, typically, uh, the uh, density of atoms in two dimensions is 10 to the power 15 per centimeter square, right? Order of magnitude in a crystal. M any crystal you take, it's roughly this. You know? So this is, and uh, that you can get by taking, you know, 10 to the power 23 to the power two thirds, right? I mean, just an order of magnitude, right? So, so just a scale it roughly. And uh, uh, so that therefore, in a, in a 2D metal, you will get 10 to the power 15 or 14, you know, roughly, per centimeter square. Metal, not semiconductor, right? And finally, for a 1D metal, like a metallic carbon nanotube, you can, again, take, you know, a uh, square root of this, if you might, and you get 10 to the power 7 per centimeter. That, those are the order of magnitudes of free carriers per unit length uh, or unit, uh, so per unit volume in all three situations, you know? 10 to the power 7, 10 to the power 15, 10 to the power 23 per centimeter cube. It's for metal. Now, when you go to a semiconductor, everything is typically, uh, you know, for example, in a semiconductor, a doped semiconductor, the carrier densities are of the order of 10 to the power 17 or 10 to the power 18, you know, something like that. 10 to the power 18 is kind of on the high, end, high, high doping. 10 to the power 18 per centimeter cube. So, so one out of a million atoms is, you know, has a free electron associated with it, you know, typically order of magnitude again, right? Uh, in a in a two D electron gas in a semiconductor, uh, for example, in a silicon transistor or a high electron mobility transistor, this will be of the order of ten to the power twelve per centimeter square, ten to the power twelve. Um, and you can again take two thirds power or whatever and get the same thing again here, right? And finally, this one. Uh, uh, will be of the order of 10 to the power 5 or 10 to the power 6 if you have a 1D quantum wire, you know, semiconductor. So, so order of magnitudes. And that's important to, you know, kind of have an idea of. And uh, the total energy is a uh, uh, few electron volts, depends on what, what situation we are in. Uh, you can calculate that. And the currents, uh, 
in uh, uh, just to get uh, you know again an order of magnitude for three dimensions in a metal you are easily pushing 10 to the power say 6 amps per centimeter square or a mega amp per centimeter square that's a current density j that flows through a metal metallic wire or metallic sheet or something in you know, order of magnitude again uh, maybe it's 10 to a 7, you know, you can easily push that much. You know. In a semiconductor, this is an extremely high current. It's typically hard, but most extremely high performance, you know, ultra fast bipolar transistors and such carry this much current. You know. so, so in, in, a, in a semiconductor, you have very, very few carriers, but they have light mass, so they have high mobility, so they are able to still drive high currents. You know. so, so. But, uh, uh, and, and in two dimensions, uh, the current density will be in, instead of amp per centimeter square, it will be amp per unit width, right? And uh, the order is milliamp, I mean, again, uh, <laughs> these are mixed units, and the re there is a good reason for that. Milliamp per micron, one milliamp per micron. This is from silicon transistor, uh, silicon MOSFET, uh, uh, you know, um, this is how much current a silicon MOSFET typically carries, one milliamp per every micron width, you know. Uh, that that's uh, this is a high end uh, of the of the conduction, and uh, for a nanotube for one dimension, uh, you know quantum wires and such, uh, it's in amps. You can see, I mean, there's no lateral dimension. It's in amperes, right? And uh, I would say that uh, max currents in most 1D conductors is a few microamperes, few microamps, you know, uh, few microamps. For example, in a nanotube, you would be probably around 20, 20 microamps or something like that in a metallic tube or even a semiconducting tube. Okay. So those are the orders of magnitudes of the currents and the densities. Okay, okay so um, questions? No, if not, uh, let's uh, apply it now to a uh, few situations. Uh, uh, now, I did not yet uh, talk about what is this group velocity, right? And the group velocity is obviously a, a central concept in uh, uh, electronic uh, properties of a solid, uh, electron transport of a solid. And uh, let me uh, write down the expression for the group velocity and then uh, uh, we'll kind of use it uh, now and uh, get comfortable with it. We have uh, uh, seen earlier that uh, you know, uh, group velocity can be derived fully quantum mechanically, but I think this is somewhat of an intuitive uh, picture of, uh, um, you know, so, so, so if I have, uh, uh, the f we know that in classical physics, my Newton's law sort of picture tells me that the force is uh, Q times you know electric field plus velocity cross magnetic field, right? This is the force which will relate it to the mass times acceleration. Yeah. So typically in a metal, I think what limits your current density is electromigration. Yes. Is that the case in a semiconductor too? Uh, it's a good question. So. Uh, uh, in a metal, if I push much higher currents, like say 10 mega per centimeter square in 10 to the 7, then the electrons collide with the atoms, and not just set of phonons, but actually they collide with such force that they are able to move the atoms. So the atoms migrate. Uh, I mean, basically, the electron current is able to, you know, just like a very strong flood can change the riverbed you know, in the same way. So it moves, and it moves the metal, and it forms voids and all that. So this was the reason why in silicon MOSFETs, uh, um, they had to change from aluminum to copper wires, you know, because copper is more resistant to electromigration. In semiconductors, what happens is typically uh, uh, by the time uh, you reach very high current densities, uh, you know, the heat, the heat, uh, thermal conductivity of semiconductors is not as good as metals. So the heat is what causes essentially bonds to break. It's just another way of probably looking at the same thing, <laughs> because uh, yeah. So it it, it actually uh, causes uh, uh, you know basically it breaks bonds and and essentially you you have uh, the no more semiconductor if you might. So so, so yeah. But but the thermal degradation is is what limits the how much current you can push through the materials. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this is your uh, classical, uh, uh, you know, uh, law of motion of tra classical transport equation, and you can write it as rate of change of momentum, right? And drawing from this analogy, uh, um, uh, and the fact that in quantum mechanics you know that x and p have this, uh, 
you know, uh, sort of a commutator relationship. Um, I, I, I'm going to write it rather than try to, you know, uh, um, um, so let's write it R, you know, distance dr by dt, which is what we're defining as our group velocity now, okay? Uh, so, no, so, yeah. uh, so the electric field is minus gradient of real space of an electric potential, right? Magnetic field is gradi uh, curl of a vector potential, right? This is, this is from cl classical electromagnetism. So this is, and this is how it looks, uh, your classical laws of uh, transport, right? Uh, this is not, not classical at all, right? So just there is that, yeah. Uh, in, in a very similar vein, uh, the quantum law of transport is, is the rate of change of momentum. In fact, uh, uh, you know, th this is an expectation value of the, dist uh, of the R value of any K state here. The way we write it is, is uh, uh, here you can see that your momentum and you have taking d over d length, you know, d over d length, and this is also dr by dt. In a very similar way, uh, you can flip it. In fact, you can show that this is actually exactly correct what we are writing now. Uh, in quantum mechanical version, you write it as E of p, where p is h bar k, which is a de Broglie relation, right? p is h bar k. So uh, this is your uh, first term, which corresponds to this term, the electric field term here. Right? I had mentioned this earlier too, but I'm just re re reiterating it. Yeah. Plus, uh, instead of dr by dt, we are finding our equation in you know other way. So we write dp over dt here, cross product <coughs> with uh, uh, again a curl of now curl is in momentum space, not in real space. So you see, basically, we just flipped everything around here. Instead of real space here, real space here, you have momentum space here and momentum space here. And this quantity here is not a real vector potential. I'm going to write it as E, just to keep in mind. And this is related to this Berry phase, or it's a, is essentially related, it's a geometric phase. And uh, in many uh, textbooks, you will not find you know, the second term because it came about only in the mid 80s uh, and uh, you know the discoveries of quantum mechanics kind of missed this whole thing you know, so and then it uh, took a while but uh, so this is the re relation this thing here is is uh, uh, called uh, uh, you can so just like a, this is a vector potential in classical electromagnetism in real space you know. again this uh, yeah whereas this is a you can call it a quasi I mean, just for now, we'll call it a quasi-vector potential. And this thing doesn't really, uh, uh, it, 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 you have to take a gradient in momentum space to get the effective you know, uh, quasi-magnetic field, if you might. Know. So this term here is called an anomalous velocity term. And, and the name anomalous is because it remained unexplained in many materials for about, you know, Half a or more than half a century, whereas this is the standard thing that you will find in many books. You know, so, so, yeah. So, in classical mechanics, we relate the um, we're able to relate the electron density to the electric field by just taking, I mean, to the potential by just taking the velocity. <coughs> yeah. Here, if you took the gradient of, um, of what can you consider an electric field. Uh, no. The, yeah. Okay. To effective mass. Right, so let, let's, uh, so here, you know, that's the electric field, right? In classical physics, uh, classical electromagnetics, and this is the electric potential, right? Yeah. Phi of R, or V of R, you can, you know, call it, either way, I just call it phi of R. Electric potential in volts, right? Yeah. And, uh, and you're taking a gradient in real space, d by dx of the potential, right? Yeah. Here, this is, uh, uh, unfortunately, this is a problem with, you know, notation. This is the energy band structure, E of K. So I can write it as E of k, and you can write it as, you know, so, so, right? This is the energy band structure of this completely, quant you know, solved problem in quantum mechanics. Yeah, yeah you, you, if you have found the band structure, just put it in here, you know. Does it make sense? And you're finding, what you're finding now is the gradient in k space, where p is just h bar k, so you're taking d by dk, you know, which is not d
by dx anymore, right? This is the other way around, right? So, it's, so all this stuff is happening in k-space now. The gradients here are in k-space or in momentum space. So. Okay, but you, can you draw that analogy? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, the effective mass part of it will all come from here, you know, so, so yeah, and we're going to look into that right now. Yeah. So, uh, so this term is the, uh, uh, you know, well, okay, so this is an anomalous term, and uh, let me just say uh, at this point, where will these things show up? Uh, this is going to give us a current in the direction of the electric field. If I apply, if I take, you know, an electrode here, electrode here, and connect maybe a 2D material, let's, you know, for argument's sake, a 2D material, a 2D crystal, or a graphene, or whatever, right? And I apply a voltage across the two, then I, am a, I have an effective electric field. You know what, let's use F for electric field, just to avoid, you know, confusion with the big E here. I have electric field, let's say, pointing that way. Then the first term is going to give us a current that flows, you know, along the direction of the electric field. If it's electrons, the opposite, but you know, I think you, you know, this is the longitudinal uh, current. This term will give us a longitudinal current, whereas this term is going to give you a transverse current, you know, perpendicular to the electric field. This term will cause electrons to go this way. Right? Though the electric field is that way, it's going transverse, and that's very strange, right? I mean, that's, that's why it remains anomalous. Remember, there's no real magnetic field at all. If you have a magnetic field, you can get Hall effect. The electrons will get you know, turned around. and all. But there's no re real magnetic field, but it'll still do that. And uh, one analogy to that is, is again, uh, again, this is somewhat of a weak analogy, but classical analogy to that is if I have, let's say, a lot of marbles rolling down, you know, uh, so this uh, rolling down a wedge, right? Uh, the, the amount of marbles I'll collect here is proportional to the first term here. Right? You just, you know, longitudinal, right? But if I had, you know, you can imagine, you know, tiny fans here, let's say, okay, which are kind of rotating in this direction. Do you know what I mean? The, there are vortices here, you know, which tiny fans that are spinning in a certain direction. Then the marbles will get kicked around to one edge, preferentially. You know? Does that make sense? I mean, so if there are these vortices going, then you know uh, maybe this will. You can see that they will. I will be able to collect some that will, you know, drain out from here. If they're rotating this way, if they're rotating the other way on the other side. Okay. So that is this term. It is. It is a term that is transverse current, and that leads to Hall effect. And later on, we'll see that this is uh, related to this Stokes theorem that gives you why there's a quantum Hall effect, why quantum Hall effect has this you know, inte integer quantum Hall effect. And it'll come from here, you know, from this term. But right now, we're going to forget the anomalous term and just look at the first term and then go with it and see the longitudinal part of the current. Does that make sense? I mean, we're looking at just the longitudinal. Uh, this is a classical an analog. And I know that at some point of time, it'll break down. The analogy will break down with quantum. But you know, I think it's a good analog. So you have vortices, and it, it, it has this you know, lateral kick because of this vortices. So yeah. OK, so, uh, so let's look at then. Uh, uh, so we're going to consider this and plug that in here and start calculating currents in many situations now. OK. <clears throat> uh, so let's start with a uh, uh, you know, very simple sort of 1D picture uh, first, and then we start generalizing. And what we're going to do is from quantum mechanics derive Ohm, uh, Ohm's law first. It's always good to see familiar things first, right? Uh, so, so Ohm's law is what? Uh, v is equal to IR, right? right? So if I take a 1D conductor and I connect two metal electrodes to it, Again, whatever I'm doing, you can easily generalize to two or three dimensions. It's just for simplicity at this point. And then I you know, have uh, one electrode, which is the source, is grounded. The other, I have applied uh, a, a certain po positive voltage here. Call it V. So this is the drain, the source. And I've applied a voltage. I'm going to call it VDS. Typically, this is the notation we use, voltage of the drain with respect to the source. Right? 
so V D minus V S or V S. So this is grounded, so it could be one volt or 0.5 volts or whatever. Right? And there's a 1D conductor, maybe a carbon nanotube sitting here, so inside here. Right? And and then uh, uh, or you know why uh, you can make it 3D uh, for that matter. I really don't. All right, so. Uh, you know that current, uh, well, uh, current and resistance in, uh, yeah, in, instead of uh, 1D, let's make it a three-dimensional box because it's easier to think of it that way. So let's say I have a resistor sitting in between that is connected on both sides. The cross-sectional area of the resistor is A, right? And the length is L, L, and cross-sectional area is A. Then what is the resistance? In classical picture, yeah. So resistance is the resistivity of the material that you have put inside here, right? Times the length over the cross-sectional area. Right? Uh, this is, you know, I think you have done this in uh, high school physics, perhaps. But uh, okay, so that's uh, uh, right. So is that okay? Yeah. So we want to get to this from a very quantum sort of picture with these EK diagrams and all that stuff. And I think, you know, the way we'll get there is uh, Ohm's law is, uh, you know, um, very far from this ballistic sort of picture we are talking about where an electron gets injected and there's no scattering and all that. It's very, very far from there, right? In, in Ohm's law, for Ohm's law to uh, hold, there must be a lot of scattering for electrons in the path as, as it goes through. And uh, the uh, so <coughs> um, right. So let me just step back for a second and, and start looking at. Uh, let's say I put in a silica, a doped silicon material here. This region is a doped silicon, uh, you know, uh, rod or something like that. And uh, it has a band structure like that, and it has a you know a conduction band minimum and then e EK diagram like that, right? So here's your E of K. You can plug it in here and find out what is my group velocity and start you know, calculating uh, this expression to find the current. And the claim is this expression will give you Ohm's law. So that's the claim. That, that expression, which is a fully quantum mechanical expression, will give, give us Ohm's law. And the way we get it here is uh, that uh, we look at this occupation function. Okay? And think about the occupation function first. So here's silicon, and uh, you know, to really uh, capture its essence of transport is, you have silicon and conduction band, and from the source, there are carriers being injected. And if it was a ballistic situation, you know, if this is the Fermi level of the source, and let's say this is the Fermi level of the drain, let's say, right, then. Uh, my situation would be uh, these states here are, you know, the right going states are populated by the source, and the source injects carriers. The left going states, maybe a few of them here, are populated by the drain, okay? And there's an imbalance in the distribution here, right? And because there's an imbalance, there's a net current. And that is very important to realize why, okay? Let's see. So the Relation of group velocity here says that the velocity of any k state, the velocity of this state, you know, or that state, or whatever, right? Velocity of any state is d e of k over d of momentum, which is h bar times k. Just the slope, right? just the slope of the e k diagram. That's the velocity of that state. This is one dimensional. If you want to generalize it into three dimensions, you just take the gradient in the case space. No. Yeah, there was a question. Sure. Yeah. Is this scenario of uh, What do you think? Is this positive or negative? The sign always confuses, right? So, what do you think here? So, uh, it, 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 it is a positive situation, positive bias on the, uh, on the drain here. Uh, one way, if, if it's uh, confusing, is, is uh, you can imagine that uh, you know current will flow from positive to the negative terminal of the battery. You know that's the notation, right? Current will flow positive to negative, so current will flow that way. So electrons must flow this way, and this energy picture should tell you yes, electrons will go from here to there. You know, so that's yeah. And positive, whenever I apply positive potential 
I always move, elect remove electrons. You know, so I pulled out some electrons from here and I put it there. If you want to, you know, so that's, this is positive. <coughs> and that thing is exactly Q times V. You know, the difference in the potential of the, uh, the potential of the battery. So, okay, so that's the group velocity of each state. And, uh, and, and, and actually, uh, um, let me just say that uh, I have not derived this for you in this class, but I'll encourage you to uh, look at the part in uh, EC4070 and MSC, you know, the, the solid state course last uh, semester where this was derived. It takes a little bit of effort to get it, you know, from block theorem, but I, do, I don't want to derive it in this class. It's just a uh, you know, bit of work. So, uh, but this is, I think, result, conceptually you can see it's a very simple result really. It's saying that the velocity is given by the slope of the band structure, EK diagram, right? And we are assuming we have solved the band structure, so we know the slopes at all points. And uh, you can sum them all, you can substitute it all here and get it, right? But we'll do the ballistic transport later. We are first looking at Ohm's law where there's a lot of scattering, okay? Now, if I do this ballistic transport here, I'll immediately get that the current, uh, let me just say, I will not get Ohm's law. If I do ballistic transport, uh, I will get, uh, you know, for the 1D situation, I will get that the current is, uh, you know, 2 Q squared by Planck's constant times voltage. You know, this is what you'll get for 1D. This is the quantum of conductance, you know, quantized the quantum of conductance. This, is, this you will get, and it's actually much easier to get this than getting the Ohm's law. You know. So, but we'll do that later. This, uh, I'm just going to postpone that a little bit right now. Let's get Ohm's law first. Then the Ohm's law, we have to make some physical arguments first. So we got the group velocity. Let's say we know this. You know? And here, uh, I think uh, there was a question of where does effective mass come in? Right? So most of the transport, a lot of the transport we'll be, uh, we'll be interested in is going to occur at the bottom of a conduction band or maybe the top of a valence band. And the bottom of any curve, you know, no matter how complicated, you can, you know, you know, if there's a minima, you can always write it as 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 a parabola, right? And this parabola here will fit h square, you know, k square by twice a certain mass, which is not necessarily the free electron mass. And if it's the conduction band, you get a conduction band effective mass, and this is where the effective mass enters the picture. Right? It depends on what atoms are sitting, how far they are in the solid, what is the crystal symmetries, but all that, once this is done, it's one parameter and it's done, you know, effective mass. And typically in silicon, along a certain direction, this is 0.2 times the free electron mass, for example, uh, free electron mass, 0.2. Gallium nitride is about the same. Gallium arsenide can be much lighter, 0 0.067 and so on, much lighter and so on. But, uh, you know, that's, that's the effective mass. And if that's the effective mass, you can see from here, that uh, if I apply this relation to this, I will get h bar k uh, over m star of c. Right? That's your group velocity in one dimension. Uh, does that make sense? It's very simple, momentum over mass. But the mass is not free electron mass, it's the effective mass. Right? So this is the group velocity of a parabolic band structure situation. Uh, you, can't, you cannot do that. In some situations, uh, uh, we'll, yeah, some, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that point later. Uh, uh, you can see it's changing. As you go to higher k's, the electron is getting faster. You know? The groove velocity is zero at the bottom, and it's getting faster as, it, as, it, as you move away from the bottom of the band. Right? Uh, if you have graphene, on the other hand, graphene has a Dirac cone band structure. So no, no matter how far you go from the center, you know, the Dirac point or the center of k, the velocity is always the same. It's not changing. It's a you know, it's a linear dispersion. Here it's parabolic, so it's changing. So. Okay, so uh, so with this uh, uh, we uh, uh, so so the now now that's the velocity. So we we have a fair idea of how to deal with this term. Now let's look at f of k, and then that's that's where the difference between scattering limited quantum transport and ballistic quantum transport comes in not in the group velocity. Group velocity, once you have decided what semiconductor material you are choosing, it's done. I mean, there's, you cannot change that with external voltages anymore. Does that make sense? This term of current is completely determined by what material you choose. Right? Whereas this term, f of k, is determined by 
the batteries and the voltages you apply from external sources, right? source drain, gate, all that stuff. They control f of k. So this is an important di dichotomy. So let me say source, drain, and gate will control the occupation function, whereas the group velocity is dependent on what material, what crystal, uh, or what, whatever material. It doesn't even have to be a crystal. It can have a amorphous material or whatever, be it. You can put in there, and uh, that's the difference of the two. Yes. Uh, so in this, you know, simplified picture, the effective mass captures what material completely, and there are a few things. I mean, what material also affects how, what is the valley degeneracy? You know, if it's one semiconductor compared to another and other things, but uh, but most uh, all of it is pretty much buried inside these two terms, you know, GV and that the material properties. You know. Uh, and then this is kind of uh, conceptually at least neat, uh, uh, and you know this dichotomy of these two controls. So, uh, okay. So so now uh, uh, the last thing is this ballistic uh, for ballistic transport. These equilibria that I talked about that the left going carriers will be in equilibrium with this, right going carriers will be in equilibrium with that. That thing is broken once you allow scattering inside the channel. Once you allow scattering, you know. These electrons that were out, you know, out here, they can scatter into those states. You know. So the difference between the right-going states and the left-going states need not be equal to the applied voltage. You know. In fact, it will always be smaller, always be smaller than that. And so, as a result, we'll see that net current will always be smaller than the ballistic case. You know, whenever you allow scattering, intuitively it should make sense. If you have scattering, there's an obstruction, right? So the current should be lower. And in case space, this is how to look at it. The maximal difference you can get between the right-going states and left-going states is given by the voltage. And that is ballistic. That's the maximum current you can get. Anything that deviates from it where you have scattering allowed, it will lead to a lower current. And, and uh, uh, the way we think about that is uh, so the force uh, on the electron is uh, h bar you know, dk dt, right? Uh, force is Q times electric field. I'm just going to do this in uh, one dimension for now. Q times uh, electric field. In one dimension, it's just that. You know, uh, again, just remember this E is electric field now. Q times electric field is force, H bar dK dt. Now, this is true if there's no scattering. If there's no scattering. Uh, and this is actually a very important result in, in uh, also in uh, that force <laughs> so is h bar dk over dt is very important result because I'm saying that no matter how you apply a force, magnetic field, electric field, whichever way you apply, if I release an electron in this state, then the effect of force is it's going to increase its k according to this relation. It's going to change its k. h bar dk by dt will change according to the force, and this is. Uh, fully quantum mechanical result. You know. This is the analog of the Newton's law. You know. so, so force is rate of change of momentum, but now the momentum explicitly says that the particle is also a wave. It's k. k is 2 pi by the wavelength. Right? It's very deceptively simple, but it's actually a very important re result. You know. so, so now, uh, if you allow scattering, on the other hand, uh, your, your relation becomes force is equal to h bar dk dt, but minus what you call as the damping term. I think, they, again, in, 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 so, so every tau seconds, there will be a scattering event that will deface the momentum. It will you know, uh, scatter and lose its momentum. Scatter, move again, and lose its momentum again. And let's say this is, you know, H bar. So there's a certain uh, damping term that uh, does not, you know, basically, uh, and then the force is Q times electric field. And we're just going to do that in one dimension for now, H bar D. Physically, what I'm doing, I'm just introducing damping and scattering in, in this picture. And now, uh, from here, you can see in steady state, all the dK by dt is go to zero. Once you have applied voltages and let everything settle down, and you're measuring the steady state you know, of current, then steady state means nothing is changing with time anymore. So that's zero. And uh, actually, electron charge is minus Q, so we should write it minus Q here. And so now you get that your delta K of electrons is given by Q times tau, right? Q 
Q times tau over H bar is Planck's constant uh, times electric field, right? So this is how much is the change in the momentum of each electron effectively, right? Because of this damping force, because of the scattering events, right? So what does it physically mean? It means that in a ballistic situation, I would have had uh, you know, uh, something like this. But what it's saying is, if I have the damping and the scattering due to all this st stuff, I'm going to just erase this now. Okay? If I have the scattering, and if I have uh, dephasing of the momentum and such things, then uh, if I started with an electron distribution in the band, which was F0 of k, this is the Fermi Dirac distribution. Uh, this is the Fermi Dirac distribution. This is the equilibrium before you even apply the voltage. Everything was in equilibrium, right? So it's Fermi Dirac. Electrons, uh, before you apply any voltage, are in equilibrium with both the source and the drain, and they're at certain temperatures T and have certain Fermi levels. So your Fermi Dirac distribution gives you the initial distribution function of electrons minus, uh, you know, say Fermi over KBT. This was the initial distribution function. And you know, for uh, simplicity, I'm going to just sketch it like this. Your Fermi level here and here. Right? And what it's saying here, though, is in, in, the, in, the, in the state of scattering that once you apply the voltage and I've allowed all kinds of scattering and I have this damping tau, and this is the characteristic term tau, then all the k's are shifted by that quantity. Right? All the k's get shifted by this quantity. So if I did not allow scattering, it will go all the way to the allowed voltage. But if I allow scattering, it's saying that this state has gone to you know, delta k here, that state has gone to, you know, delta k there. And if I were to look at it in a, you know, k space, it's just a line in one dimension. So it was equally distributed going to left or right. Now the whole thing has rigidly shifted by delta k. Distribution function has shifted by delta k. The whole function, meaning the argument of this, is shifted by delta k. So in other words, the new distribution function is k, you know, uh, minus delta k. So does that make sense? This was original distribution function. This is the new distribution function. And the delta k is re rewriting it minus q tau over h bar times electric field. That's by how much it has shifted. Yeah. Yeah. If tau approaches, but I would expect delta k to approach like the ballistic case. Uh, let me see. If you're saying, let's see. One extreme of it is if tau is zero, right? It's like constantly getting scattered. Is what? Yeah. So tau is zero would be it's constantly getting scattered. Delta it is. Yeah. Yeah. So there is. Delta K is zero, yeah. If tau goes to very large numbers, then you cannot extend it to the, uh, right, okay, I see. You're saying it's unphysical, right? Yeah. Tau going to very large uh, quantities. Uh, but you can see, uh, <laughs> okay, um, there is no t term like this if tau is very large, right? Okay. So, <laughs> um, but, but I think, you know, that's just a mathematical way of answering it. But you don't damp it at all if your tau goes to infinity and okay. you go back to ballistic and you just go with this you know okay. there's no concept of tau then in some okay. sense yeah yeah, yeah 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 so this is just momentum scaling at quantum you can call it uh, uh, um, uh, uh, all right so the way it's written in this quantity this is really momentum scattering you know uh, because it's rate of change of momentum here it's momentum scattering we will distinguish between the you know the quantum scattering which is the phase of the wave function. That's slightly different from the momentum, but it's related. You know, phase has e to the power i k dot r, so it has a k too. So, yeah. Okay, so if I take this and I now use this in this expression, uh, I will get Ohm's law. You know? so, so that's the claim. If I just use this shifted Fermi Dirac distribution, uh, uh, if I were to sketch this again, uh, Fermi Dirac distribution looked symmetric before. You know, before uh, you, so here k, 
f of k, f0 of k looks symmetric, equal number of carriers going to the right as to the left. And if I take this and I integrate the k group velocity of k times f0 of k, right, I will always get a 0. But why? Because this state is going to the right, this state is going even faster. So I sum them all up, but then there's equally opposite current going the other way. So they always sum to 0 because your Fermi Dirac distribution is symmetric, right? Because it's symmetric, each of these has a copy here which is going the opposite. So it's always 0. But the moment I shift it, you can see now that uh, you know, this is a little excess carriers here that are going to the right, or rather, sorry. I mean, you have a whole range of excess carriers now going to the right. It, there's an imbalance. And therefore, if I take this and I introduce it into this relation, uh, let me just write that down so that uh, I'm going to just. Uh, so instead of F0 of k, I get F0 of k minus q electric field over tau h bar, right? And, and here, uh, to integrate this, you can make the substitution. You know, k prime is k minus q e over, sorry, h bar tau. Right? You just make this substitution. And uh, change of variables go to k to k prime. And what you get is that the current uh, here will be, uh, you know, uh, all right, Q, you know, G, S, G, V, all that expression over there. And you get your group velocity terms. All right. So when you do that, I'm going to just write, it, write the expression down. You'll get uh, Q square uh, in G, S, G, V, um, you know, an integral of D, K, and, uh, and E squared. times tau over effective mass, which will come from group velocity, times electric field. You know, this, is, uh, this is what you're going to get. J, or the current density, is going to look something like this. And this is actually your electron density n, total electron density as we had written in the beginning of the class. You know, right? This is n, this is electron charge square, this is tau, and this is mass. So what you get is that the current density is equal to n electron charge square times tau over mass, effective mass, times the electric field. You know? So J is equal to something times electric field. This is electrical conductivity. This is the conductivity. And then you take your area and length, and you multiply by area. You get the total current, right? And total current is times area. And electric field is voltage over length, right? right? And, uh, and resist, uh, conductivity is 1 over resistivity, right? And you see you get this. Right? You get this exact expression. And it's, uh, so, so all that you did was uh, you said that the, all the k's were shifted uniformly, rigidly by this tau, you know, labeled by this tau because of scattering. And you, you recover Ohm's law, right? Now, uh, obviously of much higher interest is when you get you know, real quantum transport. This is a classical limit of transport, right? And, uh, and you can calculate based on your materials what is the you know what are these quantities. Sometimes this thing is broken up into n times q times you know uh, q tau over mass, and this would be called the mobility now. Right. So electron conductivity would be written as electron charge times the density times the mobility. So sometimes you break it up like this is a classical concept. In ballistic transport, there is no concept of mobility. Because there's no tau, there's no scattering time, and all that. So, so, uh, so we'll uh, look into the ballistic part in the next class, uh, and uh, uh, we'll basically apply this to 1D, then 2D, and look at you know all kinds of st stuff now in the ballistic situation. Okay, okay, good. So we can meet uh, again this Friday. Okay. So.